All right, here's the first question, and is this, it's for either Dr. McDonald or Dr. Charlesworth. What are your thoughts on the validity or canonicity of the Protevangelium of James? And of course, you know what that, what's in that. Which would you like, Jim? Yeah. I, I spoke on that when I, referring to Professor Zervos, uh, he is now uh, working on 140 manuscripts of this text. He has been able to show that the text is early second century and may go back to traditions that are very close to 70. And that's when I referred to Mary dancing in the temple. Uh, she was a virgin in the temple. And none of us thought that uh, this text existed, but he was able to uh, find it there. And now archeologists are saying, from our study of the temple, when it was there in the seven, up until 70, there were virgins uh, celebrating. Now, maybe dancing is not the word you would use, joyfully praising the Lord. Thank you very much. Here's a question now addressed to Dr. McDonald. What criteria were used to begin eliminating books from the Bible, resulting in the accepted Bible in use today? Okay. Thank the criteria that were used, essentially, uh, uh, apostolicity, if it was believed an apostle wrote the text, it was accepted. And there were some that we weren't sure if the apostle, apostle wrote it, an apostle wrote it, but it was accepted for a period of time. Some were questioned, like Second Peter, but uh, its initial acceptance, and then its doubts because of that particular issue. Uh, the second issue has to do with uh, antiquity. Those writings that were written closest to the time of Jesus are those that were uh, most likely to be accepted. The second century and third century churches wanted to anchor their faith in the Jesus, uh, uh, in Jesus and those that were closest to him. And Mark and Luke, of course, were not uh, apostles, but they were closest and learned from them. The third is what uh, we call Catholicity, I'm sorry, not Catholicity, but Orthodoxy, Proto-Orthodoxy, did the writings fit with that which had been handed on in tradition? Uh, if a text said that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it was zapped. If it didn't say that he died on the cross for our sins, that was at the heart of the Christian confession, it was zapped. And there's texts like that that wouldn't say that and denied it. Uh, then the fourth one was what we call Catholicity or use, widespread use. And Eusebius used this and so did the origin he said that those books, those books that were widely used in the, check, uh, the, the churches were the ones that were most recognized and therefore most likely to be canon. And the fifth one, and it's a friend of uh, ours and a former professor of uh, uh, Craig's at Claremont, James Sanders spoke about adaptability. There were some texts that served the needs of the churches for a period of time that then they no longer did, and they just fell off of the screen. They were not adaptable to new and changing circumstances in the life of the congregations. Eventually, when the books were uh, processed and said, these books are in, then hermeneutics been, began to come in and find new ways to say how relevant the text was. And sometimes they showed that uh, uh, the conclusions, those hermeneutics interpretations of the text came up with interpretations the original authors never intended, but that's how that was done. So adaptability, Time though, was very re relevant. Good man, and, uh, I think good man, and, uh, I think good man, and, uh, Here are two questions. They're both closely related, and they're both for Dr. Charlesworth. Part, <laughs> part one, can you speak of some of the problems with the texts you said would could be added as an appendix to scripture such as the Gospel of Thomas. Now let me continue with the next question. The Gospel of Thomas teaches that females must make themselves males in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Since you are in favor of adding this text <laughs> as an appendix to the canon, do you believe that this is an authentic saying of Jesus? This is all yours. <laughs> we know from studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, from some studying Jesus, the end of time will be a return to the beginning of time. Now, where did Eve come from? Adam. 
so that the woman will become the man again, and that will be an androgynous being that was fully formed and fully in love with God. So it has nothing to do with uh, hatred of women. It has a return to the, uh, the wonderful, pristine time. And thank you for asking me what I have in my hand. Yes. <laughs> I would say that I would not read that text in my church. I'd be stoned. Anyway. This next question. what you drink then. Yeah. Next question for Dr. McDonald. Now, this is an interesting question. Who wrote the Nicene Creed? Did Emperor Constantine have anything to do with it? Well, the Nicene Creed didn't deal with books. It dealt with, and I had one of the slides to talk about the importance of Nicene, and they dealt with the identity of Jesus. And the bishops came together at the uh, uh, instigation of Constantine. And they worked for a period of time trying to determine the identity of Jesus. I would have said in the slide that uh, there would have been no New Testament canon had there been no agreement on the identity of Jesus. How could you have a New Testament canon without some broad agreement on who Jesus was? So uh, Constantine constituted that uh, that uh, council, but Constantine didn't say what the outcome had to be, but he agreed with it once the bishops agreed with it. Very good. Now, here it is, the question we've been waiting for tonight. I'm not making this up. I'm reading it right off the card. Okay, what was the non-canon book that Jesus quoted, Professor Charles Ruth, in your lecture? Also, what is in the box? <laughs> Lee, would you hand me the box? Uh, no, I'd hand you the answer to the question, but if you want, but <laughs> is it down the here? The parables of Enoch. Who has the box? <laughs> ah. What I have here, no one knows about. Emmanuel Tov, all of them. And, uh, they are two inkwells from Qumran. Here is one, and I've been studying it. This is a little over 2,000 years old. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm with the Arabs, they'll say, this is a priceless antiquity. And I said, you want to see two pieces of, two, uh, uh, pieces of antiquity? <laughs> This lip, the ink would go here, and you know, if you knocked it over, uh, the ink would come out and ruin everything you've done. What if it took you 20 years to do what you've been copying? You would have to throw it all out. So this lip keeps the ink in. See, it comes up here, but it's hollow beginning here. The, the ink is in here. So this is an inkwell. Uh, this is 70% from Qumran. Uh, this one is 100% from Qumran. Uh, this was bought sometime between 52 and 56. You, you s they wanted to uh, look at these for your, your image. Have you got it okay? He's got a mic on. Okay. okay. Uh, if you have studied what an inkwell from Qumran looks like, this is it. <clears throat> and uh, this was uh, purchased by a man that it had in his private collection from about 1952 until a couple of years ago when I started buying his collection. And he said, it's clearly from Qumran, and there's no doubt it's from Qumran. And uh, if, if you say that uh, how many inkwells were found at Qumran, the scholars uh, no, don't know. Uh, if you ask what did the archaeologists found, they didn't find anything. The, the Bedouin were digging. So they said the Bedouin would bring us one. And when they said, oh, this is invaluable, the next one went into a garment and appeared uh, in, in uh, other places. Uh, I estimate there may have been as many as eight inkwells in the scriptorium. And if you find one inkwell in a house, uh, it's very, very rare. But there's no doubt Qumran is where they were composing uh, scrolls. We call them the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, that means they were found not by us. Only Cave 3 was found 
uh, by my teacher, DeVoe, and he showed me what he found in it. We went into the cave, but he did not know, nor do anybody knows, and this is part of my collection. I have over 5,000 antiquities that I've collected uh, since the early 60s. Uh, uh, and I just wanted you to see it, because what I showed you is 2,000 years ago, and when you see a Dead Sea Scroll, you can say, I actually saw an inkwell, and the ink is more valuable. I'm now working on how you date ink, because we have uninscribed leather. Oh, they can't hear me. No, you've got your mic on. You, 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 they're, they're, you're fine. <laughs> Obviously, you know, I've been doing this since I was a little kid, and <laughs> my dad had a big church, and uh, I, I, I feel very much at home in, in front of 2,400 people. Uh, of course, some of them are uh, over in other places. Um, to me, it's very exciting. I've seen uninscribed leather, and I told uh, a Bedouin, it's worthless. He said, why? Because there's no ink on it. I think that was the piece I saw 30 years later with ink on it. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, you say, why would he do that? He was willing to sell it for $250,000. So I'm trying to, I have over 48 ink wells, and now I have two more. And we're studying the ink. How was the ink made? And we have some discoveries you cannot believe, and I can't share it with you yet. Uh, but we will now be able to tell you how the ink was made, and we could date the writing, not the leather. The uh, AMS C14, the, the mass spectrometer that gives you the dating uh, of an animal when it died. You're not interested in the leather. You're interested in the ink. And the people that put the ink there were more fundamental than any of you. This is God's Word. The ink contains God's Word. So you begin to see how important this is. There is ink in these ink wells. Thank you very much, Professor Charlesworth. I'm going to come back to you in just a minute with a follow-up question. Dr. McDonald, have you discerned any geographical tendencies in canon views? Various places within the church, here or there, east, west, Egypt, as opposed to Greece, I suppose, or Asia Minor, different views in different regions relating to contents of canon? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you'll find a different collection of scriptures uh, on some of the fringes of those circulating in the West than in the churches in the East. Uh, the Eastern churches, the Orthodox churches, never had a Council of Trent. And the Protestants didn't either. And initially, the uh, Protestants were welcoming the, uh, uh, in the West, they were welcoming the apocryphal or deuterocanonical books. And uh, that, uh, you'll find that in the earliest editions of the King James Bible, and then eventually it was taken out and by 1850, very few other Bibles were still circulating those. The Ethiopian Christians, again, we mentioned them in Ethiopia, had a different collection of scriptures. The Armenian Christians uh, north of Syria had a uh, slightly different one. And there are several texts that are found in the Ethiopian canon that uh, nobody else has. Uh, the Sunados, which is really a collection of the, the prescripts that were brought together and brought to bear in several of the councils from 325 and following, those are included in the uh, sacred uh, scriptures of the Arminians. I don't, am I answering the question or did I miss it? Yeah, yeah. okay. Thank you very much. Now this, uh, this question is for Professor Charlesworth. We all heard just a few weeks ago about Cave 12, didn't we? That made news and if I may, at the risk of sounding boastful, I wrote a piece that was posted on Fox News opinion page, co-authored with Jeremiah Johnston. We, had, we, we, along with a few others, broke this news. Now, you know what's interesting? That post was watched or, or visited and read by many times more people than, than read Bill O'Reilly's post or Sean Hannity's. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? 
Now that tells me, and that was a huge surprise to the editor of the Fox Opinion webpage. But I, I wasn't surprised. People have a hunger for things relating to the Bible, the origins of the Christian faith. And everybody here could attest to that. Well, look at you. This play overflow crowd to hear about the canon of scripture, Dead Sea Scrolls conferences, and we've all been at these as speakers and so on. Invariably, it's packed to the gills. Now, in light of this discovery of Cave 12, the question for Professor Charlesworth is this. Is it possible that we'll find another cave or two, perhaps another trove of documents, maybe even a New Testament writing or a Pauline autograph? I have found many caves. Cave is north of the other caves. I have to be very ambiguous. And when you climb up, you can find a first century wall that was built. It's a huge cave, it's at least from here to there. Uh, and uh, there is evidence that you have clearly today a dry waterfall. That means that often during the year, water pours off the hills and down. And you can see where stones were in a semicircle for a good while. So this is uh, a cave that we should dig. But there are many, many others I know about. My teacher DeVoe found over a thousand caves, but he said you don't have a Qumran cave until you find a writing in it. Uh, so it's just the lack of money. Uh, to, there are many caves that, and I've been going there since uh, DeVoe took me there in 1968, before any of you were born. <laughs> Except for Chris. Uh, so, yeah, there, there, there are many more things to find. Uh, we are going to find the huge library at uh, Hatzor. We know it was the head of the Canaanite and Fichtini, and uh, we will find the library because the last time a, a, a writing was found, uh, they were sitting having lunch, and someone kicked something, and he says, oh, it's from the library. And it's, of course, a cuneiform tablet. Where is the library? So if you think the great discoveries have been made, I'm after some whole scrolls. Uh, and uh, we talked about the Ethiopian canon. It contains the books of Enoch. It contains the parables of Enoch. It contains Jude that quotes as scripture or as prophecy the book of Enoch. And uh, we thought it was a medieval composition. And now we know we have copies of Enoch, the book of Enoch, from the time of Herod the Great and all the way back to 300 BCE. It's some of our oldest writings among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I am so pleased that you're excited. Stay excited and uh, stay close to Charles because uh, he... Uh, I do want to say one last thing to you. Yes, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of variants, but we have over 35,000 New Testaments. And uh, what I would say to you, not as a Methodist minister, because you say, I, he's confessing. There is nothing that we consider in the Bible that's absolutely essential for our salvation that is in any one changed by any manuscript. That has been preserved perfectly. Now, those who make confessions say that is the Holy Spirit that God was guiding so that we get the Bible and we can trust the Bible. Maybe not a little bit here, maybe not a little bit there, but the whole is all you need to be forgiven and to be saved. And one day we will walk the streets of heaven together, and you will say, you know, weren't you a Methodist once? <laughs>